All right, everybody. Um, welcome to the first of these uh, modules. Um, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a different sort of thing. I'm wrestling with the technology a little bit here, but I got a tablet to work with and um, a PDF annotator and stuff to, uh, to demonstrate with. And I got my webcam all set up so you can see me. Um, I uh, wanted to say that like a meme I saw early on was all these professors lecturing from home and so on. Um, well, you know, we're going to be having trouble with all this kind of stuff. But one nice thing is that, well, we'll be able to lecture with no pants on. And I just wanted to establish from the start that, well, you know, I may be comfy here, but I got pants on. I mean, sort of pants. They're pajama pants, but, you know, it um, works well enough. And uh, that's what we're... Um, oh, oh what I'm going to be in, you know, like I also have this, uh, the hoodie on and so on to kind of simulate a real class situation since y'all know that I love my roots hoodies and so on. Um, anyway, uh, that's where we're at and we're going to be going through, uh, a few lectures here that follow on to where we left off before the world stopped. Um, <laughs> and that's going to be the topic of numerical integration. Okay. That is approximating integrals. Uh, maybe the reason being because we can't evaluate them directly or um, other reasons, okay? We're going to start with the topic of Riemann sums, and uh, that's something that we all know, right? That's something that we have in our background from first-year calculus. And um, so we're going to draw on that knowledge, start with uh, a, an example, or a uh, build-up and then an example. Once we're through that, though, we're going to talk about the error of using a Riemann sum as an approximation. So let's begin. Um, you know, techniques used to evaluate all of these uh, integrals and so on, as I said, it's called numerical integration. And numerical integration has another name. I'm not going to use it all that often, um, if at all, but just in case you see it in the future, quadrature is another word that some people use, okay? But all of the techniques that we talk about are going to be rooted in the idea of a Riemann sum, which we should all be familiar with. So that's where I wanted to start with a little bit of review. So let's do that. A Riemann sum is nothing more um, than an, a, a, a simple way of approximating the value of a definite integral. Thinking of this thing, the integral from a to b of f of x as an area, right? The true value of this thing is the area under the curve and above the x-axis. Okay, technically speaking, it's it, if the f is negative, then you have a couple of areas, one subtracted from the other. But um, to keep things simple, it's, it's useful to think of this in terms of, um, of areas, okay? And we can obtain an estimate of this by adding up a number of areas of rectangles. And those rectangles are defined by the height of the function without doing any integration whatsoever. So if we consider that domain of integration from A to B, um, there are a couple of steps that are involved. And the first is going to be uh, to discretize. Discretize just means evaluate, kind of notch out that domain into a bunch of different nodes, the different points that you're going to um, uh, yeah, kind of chop up that domain into. That creates uh, n sub intervals and in each one of those sub intervals we're going to choose some sort of evaluation point we're going to call it xi and then the the height of the rectangle is going to be f of xi the height of the function at that evaluation point okay the width of the rectangles is just the difference between each of those evaluation points uh, and then the estimate is given by this sum which then uh, makes a lot of sense, right? It, it often looks intimidating to some people to look at a sum and, and try to parse it up, but don't think of it as being too crazy, right? This f of xi is nothing more than the height of the ith rectangle. <laughs> kind of ironically, we're using hi for the widths here instead of heights, but if you think about that, we've been using step sizes for h, and so a lot of like differences between x's and so on. Um, <laughs> We're going to get rid of this. And uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. The H's are uh, then going to be those widths, while the F's are the heights. And we can think of the, the height of a function as being, uh, right, it makes sense to have that as a height. So I'm just going to say here that the H's are 
the height, or the, not the height, the width of the ith rectangle. And so together, right, you multiply those together, you get an area, you sum up over all those areas, you get an approximation of the area under the curve, right? And it goes with this picture that a lot of us should be very comfortable with this at this point. If I draw like a quick axis here and a curve um, like this somehow, you know, you can parse up this domain into a bunch of subintervals, you know, like here are, it looks like four subintervals. And if I choose, say, an evaluation point right there, no, that's not what I want. Sorry. Let's go back here and try again. If I choose a sub, uh, uh, an evaluation point right there, and maybe this one has an evaluation point there, and this one right there, and this one right here, I'm going to draw rectangles that are defined by the height of the function at each one of those. So the first rectangle will be this high. Oops. The second rectangle would be the height of the function right there. And drawing it something like, oops. Nope. Like that. And the third one evaluated right here would be, oh, it's hard to say, like about there maybe, right? That is, about the height of the function there. And the last one is going to be a rectangle defined sort of like this. Okay, just in this picture right here. So something like that, this area underneath would be the area that the Riemann sum finds, and that would be an approximation of the true area under the curve. Okay, so that should all be pretty familiar. We should be in our happy zone, our comfy place in order to talk, talk about that. It's kind of funny, right? In the beginning, like back in calculus, we defined definite integrals in terms of Riemann sums, right? We came up with a Riemann sum and then said, okay, what would happen if the number of rectangles went to infinity as the width of all the rectangles went to zero, right? In that case, those rectangles end up filling up the area exactly and you get the true area. And that's how we actually defined a definite integral. That norm of P um, is just a special notation that says, that the width of the largest subinterval goes to zero, therefore making all the subintervals go to zero. In that limit, right, you get the true area. And that's how we defined the definite integral in the first place. So we're gonna take that anyway, and, um, uh, and recognize that now we have talked about Riemann sums again, but like in themselves, without taking that limit, they are going to produce a decent approximation under the right circumstances for an integral in the first place. So it's almost like taking a step back and saying, okay, wait a second, instead of taking the limit, let's use this as an approximation and um, see how well it works. So we're gonna go through an example and uh, it's gonna be an example that's no harder than what uh, you had in first year. And uh, we'll see about this, okay? We're going to be inter uh, evaluating uh, the integral from zero to one of the sine of x squared. Well, we can't evaluate it directly, so we're gonna use a Riemann sum instead to estimate the value of that, okay? This does happen to be one of those functions that does not have an antiderivative, so you can't find the integral using classical methods. You have to do something else. So instead here, we're gonna use this Riemann sum. Four subintervals, four subintervals means that um, if they're equal width, uh, it's pretty easy to see that if we integrate between zero to one, four different subintervals there means that each of those um, h values are gonna be the same. So instead of h i, I'll just say h and we'll let that be 0 0.2. So let's write something like that uh, down. So four equal subintervals. Okay, so then, um, nope, on uh, zero to one is going to be uh, resulting in an h value of 0 0.25, and that's gonna be the width of each rectangle. And what we're gonna find here is switching to uh, red. 
we're going to find that the area is, and what I should actually do is say that the, the, the uh, value of the integral, but here it would actually be an area under the, uh, under the curve, and it will be approximately equal to, and let's see here, it's going to be, um, well, let's look. We actually have the, the left endpoints of each subinterval as the evaluation points here. So if I'm thinking of chunking up that domain, kind of like I did for that general picture before, let's draw some, some uh, rectangles down here. The first one's going to stretch from 0 to 0 0.25. I'm using the left endpoints of each subinterval as the evaluation points. And so the first one is going to use the height of the function at 0 and go across, right? So my first rectangle is not much of a rectangle, it's got height 0. The second one is going to stretch between 0 0.25 and 0 0.5, like this, okay? But I'm using, again, the left end point as the evaluation point, so that's how high the rectangle is. The third one goes from 0 0.5 through to 0 0.75, so something like that. And the last one is going to go from 0.75 to 1. Now note, we are going to get here an underestimate of the curve, and that's because of the, the kinds of evaluation points we had, as well as the nature of the function, which is going up, right? If we were to use the right endpoints instead, I'd end up with an overestimate for the true area, okay? There are other choices that you can make as well, of course, as, as you all know. So thinking about this, and especially with that picture in mind, don't be afraid to draw a picture if you ever need to, the area is going to be given by, well, f at 0 times the width of the interval, so that's the height, and then times the 0 0.25. And then I'm going to add f at 0.25 times 0.25, this is going to be the second rectangle, and then continue on, plus f of 0 0.5 times 0.25, and then finally f of 0 0.75 times 0.25. And if you see what the function is, which is just sine of x squared, you can actually evaluate that, right? I can plug in f of 0. I'm going to get here f of 0, f of 0.25, f of 0.5, and f of 0.75. I'm going to get here the sine of 0 squared times 0.25 plus the sine of 0.25 squared times the 0.25. And so on across all of those rectangles. I'm going to do this. I could have been smarter and actually factored out that 0.25 first, which I can always do if the subintervals are the same, right, in width, but I didn't because that's just me anyway. Um, if you work this out, I just plunk these into a calculator, uh, came up with the, pro the first one's easy, right? Sine of zero, zero. So the first rectangle has zero area. You can see that in the picture, no problem. Uh, the second one, as we go across, we get little contributions here. I have here a, sorry, I worked these out in advance. I know that usually I'd get like my Alex in the late section would be right there with an answer. Or Fletcher would probably yell it out in the earlier, so, you know. Um, but here I had to do everything in advance. So we get here uh, point zero one five taking like, I don't know, random numbers of significant figures here. I'm sure that, uh, you know, the chemists out there would be rolling in their graves. Um, well, if they're dead, I guess. And the ones that are alive are probably rolling off their um, lab benches or whatever. But, oh well, I'm a mathematician. I'll let them I'll let them grape over thousandths and ten thousandths and so on. Anyway, um, the, the rounding here is going to end up being... Uh, uh, leading to a result that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 0 0.2108. And that would be an approximation, an underestimate of the true area, okay? And that should be familiar, that should not be that stressful to look at. Um, but that's a review of how a, a basic Riemann sum works. One thing that's not review, though, is to think about... Uh, what is going to be the error associated with one of these approximations? And that's what I would like to, ch to check out next. So we're going to actually do a little bit of work to derive how far off an estimate using a Riemann sum is, which is something that we haven't done before, okay? So in our next example, we're going to come up with um, that error bound for the integral across the domain, a to b, okay? And 
I chose right evaluation points just to, to make things a little bit different from the last one, but I want you to look at this. Uh, if we have here the right evaluation points, I can define them in the following way, right? I have xi equals a plus i times b minus a over n, and that's for i equals 1 to n. Think about this. If I have i equals 1, that's going to give me a plus a single 1, b minus a over n a little bit, right? And the b minus a over n itself is nothing more than, well, the whole domain divided by the number of rectangles, the b minus a over n, this is just the width. This is just the width of each rectangle. Okay, so that's kind of useful, right? Uh, I can uh, kind of think of it in this way, right? The first one's going to give you a plus a bit, the left hand point plus a bit, that's your first evaluation point. And then you, as the i goes up, I'm adding little bits going all the way across until I get to i equals n. And when, imagine when i equals n. I get a plus n times b minus a over n. n's cancel out. I get a plus b minus a, which is b. So the last one is going to give me the right end point, which is exactly what I need, okay? Now, so this is what we're doing. Those are my evaluation points that I'm using here. Um, you can do a similar sort of derivation using left end points, um, but we're gonna approximate this value, find the error associated with it. And to start, we're gonna go back to some familiar tools. I know that we've used mean value theorem a lot over the semester, and we're going to right here as well. So we're gonna start with um, uh, F having enough smoothness properties that we talk in the first place, right? It has to be continuous and differentiable and so on, so that I can even talk about this. Um, but, I mean, that works for most of the functions we're ever concerned with, and we'll make that assumption going forward. So we know that for, um, if, a, if a function is suitably smooth um, between xi and x, I can say, based on mean value theorem, that, that f prime of c is equal to the f of xi minus f of x over xi minus x, blah, blah, blah. But that is, <laughs> there's some point c at which the slope of the tangent is the same as the straight line slope between x and xi, okay, for some c between the two. We're going to start by actually multiplying up the denominator first and then integrating over um, that denominator, uh, over values of x, okay? And what that's essentially going to do is give us uh, some sort of relationship between an approximation and the true value over that small interval, and then we'll add up all the intervals, okay? So let's just do what I said there. And I'll change to my red marker here, and we're going to get this. We get f of xi minus f of x equals f prime at c times xi minus x. And uh, we're going to integrate between xi minus 1 and xi. I'm going to integrate each one of those terms, okay, and that's going to give me this, the integral from xi minus 1 to xi of x, f of xi dx, okay, next one, xi minus 1 to xi of f of x, this is xi dx, and on the right, we have the same sort of thing here, f prime of c, let's think about that, um, it's really just a constant, isn't it? Because this is going to be, there's some c between the two, that's a particular number, f prime at that number doesn't depend on x itself, it's a value. I can take that value and float it outside the integral so I don't have to worry about it so much. So why don't I do that? I'm going to write it outside the integral and write f prime of c right there, and then I have this to deal with, f i x i minus x uh, dx. Okay, from there, um, we want to figure out what to do with this. So why don't we do that integral? You might look at each piece and get a little bit intimidated, but look at the leftmost, right? The leftmost, the f of xi, this is f evaluated at a particular node. In other words, right, f of xi, this is just a number. And if that's just a number, we know what the integral of a number is. It's the number times x. And I can evaluate that between xi minus 1 and xi. And that's going to give me an expression that isn't actually that hard to work with. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to get here f of xi um, 
and then times, it would be times x and then evaluated between the two, I end up with xi minus xi minus 1, like that. Okay, the second quantity, that looks like an inter... I don't know how to integrate f, that was the whole problem to begin with. So I'm going to leave this um, there for now. But you see what I'm forming, right? If you look at the left-hand side, I've almost got a difference between two things. The first is a height times a width, which looks like a single rectangle. The second is the true integral. And what I've got there is a difference between the two, which smells a lot like the error. So that's what I'm building up right here, just so you have some idea of the path that we're taking. On the right, just looking at my notes for a second to make sure I'm, I'm uh, doing okay here, uh, yeah, I can actually evaluate this integral without much problem, because all I have here is an, an x term, and uh, what I get is going to be this. f prime of c is happy to sit and watch. I end up with a minus, uh, let's see here, how do I want to write this down? Minus xi minus x squared over 2, and I'm going to evaluate this quantity between xi minus 1 and xi. Imagine me working with this now, right? I can sub in the xi. If I do, I'm going to get zero. And so that's the first. And then using a uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, I subtract the xi minus one, and that gives me subtract a minus, I get a plus. It's going to give me an xi minus xi minus one with a plus sign in front with the squared and so on. So this is actually going to be on the right equal to f prime at c and then xi minus x um, i minus 1 uh, squared. Oh, I see. I have to be a little bit careful here, right? This here uh, should not be applied to the 2. The 2 is on the bottom, just to, just to be clear. So this is going to be, um, uh, let, me, let me see here. This should be at x i minus x minus 1 squared, and then I'm going to put that over 2 like that, okay? And uh, that seems like it's not bad. But uh, let's see here. There's actually one step further that I can take, and it's actually to go back to the very first assumption that uh, we had equally spaced subintervals. It's to say, if those are equally spaced, then the difference between xi and xi minus one is predictable, right? That's a, a width, and the width is always going to be given by, well, the whole width of the domain divided by how many rectangles I have. So um, I just want to write a note about that here, and maybe I can even simplify this down a little bit. So note that width equal subintervals, we have that xi minus xi minus 1, oops, Let's just, it's, that's a subscript where it's supposed to be, um, is equal to, is the same as, it's going to be b minus a over n, right? The whole width of the domain divided by the number of uh, intervals. And the reason why that is a useful thing to do is because in order to construct an error bound, it's useful to get rid of the dependence on that i that's right there, okay? And so I'm actually going to take this and I'm going to write one more line below um, just to write it in this nicer way. This is f prime of c, and thinking about this carefully, this is going to give me a b minus a over n squared, like that. I'm going to take the over 2 and just kick it out front here for a second, okay? So, this is what I've got so far. Almost there, we have to do a little bit of work here because I only have this quantity over the ith rectangle. I want to take it over all of the rectangles to get that Riemann sum. So we're going to introduce a sum shortly. So we're going to take the sum of this quantity from i equals 1 to n and add up all those contributions from each of the subintervals. So let's do just that. If I take the sum from i equals 1 to n, and the first quantity is going to be that f of xi, xi minus xi minus 1, like that. Okay, the next is going to be a subtraction of a sum from i equals 1 to n of the integral that we found on that last step, like that, f of x dx. 
And on the right, I'm going to have a sum from i equals 1 to n of, and then that quantity that we had there. So that's f prime at c. Um, I'm going to write this down maybe as a b minus, just separating this out, b minus a squared. This is n squared, imagine evaluating that n, right? And I'm still going to have that 2 kicked out front just like that. Okay, I want to look at each of those pieces, right? Because the first one is really familiar. If you think about it, the first one is a height times a width, the ith one. And I'm summing all of them up. What is that? That's nothing more than our Riemann sum. And so I'm going to just say, this is our Riemann sum. The next thing I see is an integral. And I'm, I'm adding up, let's see, n of these integrals. And the first one's going from x0 um, through to x1. And the next one's going from x2 uh, through to x3 and so on. And um, uh, so if I am, am working with that, you can see that the very first um, uh, quantity that I'm going to take, if I define that x0 to be the a, the, that I begin with, and the um, last one, the nth one, is the b, the right side of the domain, this is equal to nothing more than the integral from a to b, right? I'm adding up the areas for each one of those sections, and so um, the sum of all those areas is the area of the whole, right? That is making this assumption um, that x0 is equal to the a, the very first one. So I'm going to write that down right here to make sure that uh, uh, that we have something here. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense considering that x1 was like uh, uh, a right end point, and so the, the one before it would have been, well, the starting value. So we'll call that a and uh, go forward. I think it makes some sense, right? And what this represents is the true value of the integral. Okay, you see what we built on the left now. We have a difference between a Riemann sum and the true integral, which sounds a lot like error. And what we're going to do is think about what uh, we can find on the right. And on the right, it might look really awful, but I'm summing up a quantity that's full of constants and stuff, right? F prime of C, just a constant. B minus A, B and I are defined at the start of the question. Those are well-determined constants. N is our number, i.e. a constant, of subintervals that we have. That quantity is fixed, and I'm adding it up. That plus that plus that plus that plus that N times over. How much do I get? Well, I get N times that number. So this here, this last quantity here is adding up the same quantity n times. So we're going to get that this is equal to n times f prime at c over 2, and then a b minus a squared over n squared. We're almost there. We're almost there. I am going to... Uh, just kind of simplify this a little bit um, before we go forward. Here, we're going to obtain here um, the Riemann sum. Uh, let me just change back to red. The Riemann sum, I'm just going to copy this from the last line. So i equals 1 to n of f of xi, and then xi minus xi minus 1. Uh, we said that this was subtract, and now I'm going to write the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and on the right, I'm going to let those ends play together, and I'm going to get a quantity that looks like this. f prime at c, uh, b minus a squared, the ends cancel. I'm going to just put this whole thing over 2n. Okay? The last thing that I'm going to do is a couple of assumptions, right? I have that one quantity is equal to another. If two quantities are equal, then their absolute values are equal. So I'm going to take the absolute value of each, each side. Remember, so you have to take the absolute value of the whole side, otherwise you're telling a, a big lie. Um, at the same time, I'm going to say that the derivative is bounded. It's one last assumption that I have to make in order to build a solid bound. But if I assume that f prime is less than or equal to some quantity m, right, the saying that the derivative, the slope, is no bigger than a certain amount in magnitude, 
Okay, that means it, it that um, the slope is never beyond a certain amount. So like that kind of rules out the uh, possibility of asymptotes or anything like that happening. Okay, so I'm going to make this assumption that f prime is less than or equal to some m. All right, it's an upper bound on the slope, and that lets me uh, replace the right hand side. So actually, I'm going to um, uh, put that into place kind of in the midst of the, uh, I'm going to use this right here and say that this here um, is going to mean that the, this quantity is less than or equal to m times b minus a squared over 2n. Okay, so I'm going to take the absolute value of both sides before I do that, okay, and then apply this, and that's going to bring me to the result, okay? So that's just a, an idea of, of how this is going to unfold, and so we're going to end up with this. We get that the absolute value, i equals 1 to n of f of xi, and then that width of those rectangles, and then subtract that true value of that uh, integral right here, is going to be equal to the absolute value of some f prime of c b minus a squared over 2n, like that. And then I can say that this quantity with that bound is less than or equal to um, m. And then if you think about that, the other quantities in that uh, absolute value, they're all positive, b minus a squared, you're squaring it, it's positive. The n is just a number of rectangles, it's positive. I can actually drop the absolute values on the right hand side. I get m times b minus a squared over 2n. And what you have on the left is now with those absolute values in place, the true error, the absolute error between the Riemann sum and the true, uh, the Riemann sum and the true value of the integral. And we have that that quantity on the right is a bound on the on the error. And it's determined by those quantities, right? That upper bound on the slope, the m, the b and the a, and the n, which are all properties that establish the domain of integration. Okay? So, uh, why don't we take that and try to use it to kind of showcase uh, the uh, different, uh, uh, the last example and how that kind of uh, works out, okay? So if you look at the last example we did, we did the integral from zero to one of sine of x squared, four subintervals. That tells me immediately that n is four, okay? I know what b and a are, they're one and they're zero. So actually, let's um, let's write some of those things in. a equals zero, b is equal to one. This here, I kind of did some work and calculated that the maximum value of the derivative of that function is equal to about 1.284. That's the upper bound on that uh, that quantity. That's that's our m for this example. Okay, and so we can easily take that and establish um, uh, that upper bound on the error, uh, and so that uh, that would also use n equals four, right? So let's let's do just that, and we'll see that the error, right, is less than or equal to and it was uh, that m times b minus a squared over 2n. And in this case, that m was 1.284, the b minus a was one, and the number of rectangles we had was four. And if you work this out, I forgot to work this out in advance, so let's just uh, do that. I'll pull up my calculator here, 1.284. I do believe that this is uh, divided by 8, and we get 0 0.1605. So, 0 0.1605. And this is the most our estimate might be off by. Okay, so you can use this error property to kind of estimate how bad your estimate, to approximate about how bad your estimate could possibly be, and then use that to maybe determine, you know, how many rectangles you might need to get within a certain amount. And of course, as 
you get more and more rectangles, and as that width decreases, the area is going to shrink towards zero. Anyway, um, thanks for sticking with me so far. That's about how far I'm going to take this first video. We're going to get into some other methods with my next video, which should be released uh, within a few days. So thanks a lot, uh, good luck, and let me know if you have any questions.